Happy Memorial Day, by the way. And we are in this series called Hashtag Struggling. Today we're going to talk about struggling to share our faith. Struggling to share our faith. Uh, there's a lot of closet Christians. There's a lot of people who have a belief system, but no one ever knows it. Kind of keep it on the DL. It's like politics. We don't talk about politics or religion, so we just kind of keep it quiet. And I want to walk you through a couple scenarios about how I think, now please don't be offended. If you're offended by this, just, can we just laugh for like a little bit? Like, I want to make fun of Christians. Is that okay? Can I make fun of Christians for like two seconds? So I'm technically making fun of myself, but just like, if you're going to invite somebody over your house for a Memorial Day barbecue, I'm going to invite you over for, for a Memorial Day barbecue. I hear Christians say this sort of thing to other people. People who are not church people. Hey, brother, want to come over to my house for some fellowship this weekend? Fellowship? What are we gonna be? What are we gonna be doing? Fellowshipping. Fellowshipping? No, no, just come on. Just think about this for a second. You've never gone to church. What does fellowshipping mean to someone who's never heard fellowship before? So maybe one guy shows up to your party and he's got fishing gear on because he thinks that the fellas are going out on the ship. <laughs> maybe you got some dude that shows up in like a long robe, something out of the uh, Lord of the Rings because he thinks we're doing the fellowship of the rings. <laughs> maybe you got some dude shows up to your house in a suit, three-piece suit and tie. Because when he was a kid, his grandma said the word fellowship, and that meant church. Because we have a fellowship hall at church. See, I'm just, I'm just kind of trying to ask, like, it's easy to use terminology that the world wouldn't understand, that an unchurched person wouldn't understand, to try to share your faith. What would come over my house for fellowship mean? Okay, so... You have everybody over your house, you got them there, however you got them there, you invite them to fellowship, you invite them to a barbecue, whichever way you use your terminology. I just think it would have been easier to say, want to come to my house for a barbecue? I can understand that. I don't know what a barbecue is. Not really sure what fellowship is, I know what barbecue is. You finally get them over your house, you got the grill going, got the smoker going. Hey guys, just before we, before we begin, before we partake, of the bounty in which our Lord Jesus has provided for us. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer and bless our food. Amen? Dear God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come by, will be done. God, we present these hot dogs and hamburgers before thee at the altar of sacrifice unto thee, God. Ten minutes later, we're still going. And I'm hungry, because I came over for fellowship. And I think fellowship means hot dogs and hamburgers, but I'm really not sure. First, why we got to change our voice to pray? Why did we go from, yo, what's the hope for? Did we, did we somehow immediately become spiritual? over hot dogs and hamburgers. We couldn't have said, Lord, we thank you for this food. Bless it to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Bam, done, good. Ah. Are, are, we, are we impressing somebody with the knowledge of Scripture? Thy word says in 1 Peter 2.20. Like totally doesn't have nothing to do with the food. <laughs> Come on, I'm just, I'm just asking questions. I'm asking questions as to, is this how we're going to share our faith? with a generation that is post-Christian. Generation Z, the millennials, are post-Christian. They are being raised in homes where there is no knowledge of God. The first generation that, does not, that has never been to church. So when you use the word fellowship, when you change your voice in prayer, yo, what just happened? 
wait, how long do we pray? Like, I thought we were blessing the food. How long does this have to be? Is this intermission? <laughs> all right, come on. I'm poking fun at me, all right? I'm poking fun at me. Don't take offense. You got everybody there? You prayed over the food? It's all good? You got them all sitting down? Hey, guys, while you're partaking of the bounty in which our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for, how about you take out your iPhones? We're gonna do a quick Bible study. We're gonna do a quick Bible study. It says in Leviticus, now you know we start digging in Leviticus, we got problems. We got problems. We start sharing Bible verses out of Leviticus. It's about to go down up in this barbecue. Listen, man, not every get together has to be a Bible study. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I prayed when I woke up this morning. He's in my midst. The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwells and lives in my mortal body. I am a Bible study. You are a Bible study, okay? You are the light of the world, all right? I'm just saying, if you invite somebody over for a barbecue, don't throw a surprise Bible study. Don't throw a surprise Bible. Whoa! It's like, yo, when I was a teenager, I hated this, man. When I was a teenager, we would go Christian roller skating night. Anybody ever did Christian roller skating night? You're in the middle of roller skating, you paired up with a girl or a guy, you're like holding hands, just met each other, like, ah, having a good time, and then the youth pastor comes out, all right, shut the music off, everybody sit down in the middle, we're gonna Bible study. At the roller skating rink? Right now? I was about to get a number. Come on, I'm poking fun at me. Don't, don't take offense. Enjoy the moment. And then we have this other struggle, right? We have this other struggle. The longer we've been a Christian, our language changes. Our language changes. And we start using terminologies and phrases that people don't know what we're talking about. Yo, brother. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored Lord. How are you? Well, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Won't he do it? Oh, he will. We get into these conversations of these slang phrases of Christianese. Christianese, yeah, Christianese. And we start speaking this Christianese, and the person who came over for your fellowship barbecue get-together now feels like an outcast because they don't speak your language. I don't, I don't speak that. I don't know what those words, I'm not in the, in, I'm supposed to know this? I'm supposed to know this? I'm supposed to know those words? I'm supposed to know the response? And if I don't, I don't feel like I could fit in. Okay, now listen. Please hear me, I'm not trying to offend anybody. If you're watching online, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just trying to pose some questions and to ask why. Why do we use these words? Why do we act this way? Why do people change their voices in prayer? Why? Why? Hashtag, struggling to share my faith from a book written over 2,000 years ago. And if you've never had that struggle, then you haven't tried to actually share your faith out of a book written 2,000 years ago. Because it's hard. It's hard to share your faith from a book written 2,000 years ago. It's hard to share your faith from a book that most of us, our very first translation of that book was in the King James Version. The, thou, thy. These words that we just are not relevant, are not relatable today. I wanna share a passage of scripture with you today. And yes, I'm teetering on the edge today because my heartbeat is to actually reach your neighbors for Jesus Christ. 
everybody on your street should be in heaven for all eternity because God put you on that block. But I wanna help you in a way that doesn't make you the weirdo. All right, ready? Let's look at this. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19, Paul says this. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So he was not something, but he made himself that way in order to reach somebody. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, watch, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one who did not have the law, though I am not free from the law, I'm I'm free from the law, uh, God's law, I'm under the law of Christ, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. Okay, do we get that? Well, let me describe it, let me explain it. What Paul was not saying, Paul was not saying to the alcoholic, I become an alcoholic so we can have a good time. (laughs) That is not what he said. To those who want to live a lascivious life, I become lascivious so that we can party it down in Cancun. That's not what he said. Paul is not doing these things. He's not matching the lifestyle of the world so he can have a good time. He makes it very clear. He's altering his behavior or he alters his language for what reason? There's only one reason. To lead people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he might reach people. That people might be saved. Right? So he, to to reach the Jew, I acted and became like them. So I would eat the food that they ate and I would speak the way they spoke. Do you know what that means? That means that he was not speaking the language that he uses in church to reach people out on the streets. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, really, you, you go over a coworker's house, they've never been to church, they give you hamburgers and hot dogs. Hallelujah. They don't know what that meant. Nobody outside of church uses the word hallelujah. It's not a word out on the streets. Paul says, I become what I need to become to the crowd I'm with in order to lead them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. We gotta get this. He made it very clear that he would change his speech. He would change his language. Not, listen, not to simply fit in. Not, to, not, not so that he wasn't an outcast. Not so he could be the cool kid on the block. But that they could see Jesus in him. What would it benefit? What would it benefit if I stood in this pulpit today and spoke Gaelic just because I'm Irish, all service. It would be no benefit, right? So even like, we sang, we sang two lines in Spanish. I don't know how to say those words. So I backed up off the microphone because I don't know why I'm esta sababu. I don't know what I would have been saying, right? 
because it's not my language. I haven't learned those words, so I wouldn't say those things because I wouldn't reach people. Now, we added two lines of Spanish into our song because if someone in here, that is your language. Oh, they're speaking my language. Come on, you get this? Paul says, I speak the language of those around me that I might reach them. So he may abstain from eating a certain kind of meat if he was with a crowd of people who did not eat that kind of meat. Although he was free to do it, he would not become a stumbling block for someone else who thought that was a sin. He did all these things that he might reach people for the kingdom of God. I want you to understand this today. Heaven is the reward of accepting the finished work of Jesus Christ into your life. I believe that salvation is available to everyone. I, I, I could almost, I could almost like go to this whole point where like Jesus said, I paid the price for the sin in the world. But there's just one clause in this whole thing. You gotta accept it. You gotta accept it, it has to become your truth. You have to believe it. You have to say, yes, he paid the price for the sin of the world for me. And I wanna have a relationship with God. That, that's, that's, the, that's the only stumbling block. That's the only clause. But listen, the point of death is so we can get to heaven. Hear, hear what I'm saying here. The point of death is to get to heaven. And I know that a lot of people think that the point of Christianity is heaven. It is, it is a point. But the point of Christianity is to share your faith. The very first command that Jesus gave his disciples was, now go into all the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go do this. I anoint you. I've prepared you. I've instructed you. Share your faith. And we're to duplicate ourselves. We're to share our faith with as many people as we possibly can. Now, the, the struggle is, how do I do that without being weird? Because for me to use language that was highly relevant 2,000 years ago is not relevant today. Ooh, I know, I know. I'm hearing it, and I'm like, what are you doing? You messing yourself? I get it. Let's have the fellowship of the brethren was highly relevant 2,000 years ago. That was a statement that they would use and how they would speak 2,000 years ago. Listen, the message of the gospel is always relevant, but the method of the gospel has to change. The methodology, the method by which we do Christianity has to remain relevant with the times. It has to be with today. Listen, if we said that the way that we need to travel from city to city was on camelback and donkeys, we wouldn't be relevant today. Come on, somebody. If we thought, if we thought that we actually had to get into our cars and drive to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That would take a long time. We now have something called the internet. And I am on the internet right now, live. And there are people from all over the world who tune into us live. I am going into all the world. That was not available then, but it's relevant today. Language that was relevant then is not relevant today, and we have to adjust our language to reach those who speak the current language. The method of the gospel has to move forward with the times. Here at Family Church, we believe in something called relational evangelism. Relational evangelism. Evangelism. And I'll be honest, I've tried all of the evangelism. I've tried, I've tried it all. 
Um, I was part of this group that went up to Syracuse College and we walked the campus and you know, we would tell people, hey, if you were to die today, die today, you going to heaven or hell? I'm going to heaven. Based upon what? I'm a good person. Oh, you are? Have you ever stolen something? Never even like a pack of gum? Yes, I have. Oh, have you ever looked at someone as to lust after them in your heart? Yes, I have. Oh, well, the Bible says that these things mean you're going to hell. Pray this prayer of salvation with me today. And they would do it just to get me out of their face. And as I walked away, my 10 cent track was thrown on the ground. We just littered. And no one actually had a heart change. They just wanted to shut me up. Now, do I believe in street evangelism? Absolutely done the right way. I absolutely believe in street evangelism done the right way. But making somebody feel bad about themselves was never Jesus' motto. The Bible says that it was the goodness of God that led man to repentance. Yeah. That when he was going to reach someone like a Peter, when he was gonna reach a Peter, he gave him a boatload of fish. It was at the boatload of fish, the blessing beyond measure, that Peter fell to his knees. He said, I'm not worthy to be in your presence. You are my Lord and you are my God. It's the goodness of God yeah. that leads man to repentance. And if we keep trying to be in some old model of making people feel bad about themselves to control their behavior, that's not God. That's not God. That's not even good. That's not even good. We're talking about a loving and caring God, a God who actually doesn't even control your behavior. He says, here's the best way. Here's the best plan. This is what I've designed for you. But you choose. You choose. I lay before you this day, life, death, blessings, cursings. Choose life, choose blessings, choose best, but I'm not gonna micromanage every single step that you take. Just love me, hear from me. I will lead you, I will guide you, I will direct you. In, all. in fact, I will send myself to live and abide inside you. I will send the Holy Spirit to be your comforter and your guide. Just listen. But if you choose not to, I'll still be here. Come on, somebody. Relational evangelism. Relational evangelism is sharing your faith with those that you know, those that love you, and those that you're in a close relationship with. All right? So let's, let's look at this for a second. The best people to share their faith, the best people to evangelize are the people who get saved today. Now, nah, this is gonna mess you up. This is gonna mess you up, because this is gonna take the whole philosophy and just turn it upside down. Well, I need to be a mature believer. I need to do the sacraments of Christianity before I can share my faith. You know what the problem is? The problem is the longer you are a Christian, the worse you get at sharing your faith. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, I know, I know, I know. I know this don't make any sense, but we need a mind shift. The best people to evangelize and share their faith are the people who accept Jesus today. Why? Because 99% of everybody you know doesn't know Jesus too. The longer you're a Christian, the more isolated you become. You've already shared your faith with other people, and so now I don't really know anybody who's not saved. I don't really hang out with anybody who's not saved. I, I don't have anybody who's like really going through major problems in life because we've, we've already, we all church people. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. But the person who gets saved today, they were invited by somebody. They came, they, 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 they accept Jesus. They've got this whole network of people that have never heard the story. They're the best to share their faith. You see, because Christianity grows on the fringe, not from the center. It grows from the edges and, and bigger, 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 bigger. That's why Jesus said, go, go into all the world. He was only with them for three years. Some of those dudes he had just picked up that week. And he wasn't just talking to the 12, he was talking to the over 200 that were following him. It says that, the, that, that God added to the church daily 
daily. And it got to the point where it wasn't Paul himself or Peter himself doing the evangelizing. It was the people who got the gospel today. Now go and tell. Look at the lady, this, the, the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. She went and she immediately evangelized her whole city. She said, you got to come hear this guy who just told me everything about myself. She was the best evangelist he could have had. Not the priest. He didn't go into the temple and say, okay, let's formulate an evangelism plan where we can hit the streets. Come on, somebody. Brand new Christians are the best at evangelizing because pretty much everyone they know are non-Christians. Now, this is of no shame, but the longer you're a Christian, the less effective you actually are at evangelizing. The longer you're a Christian, the better you are at explaining scripture and having Bible studies because you're, you're more learned, but you have actually become very isolated from the world. Studies show that 82% of unchurched people would attend a church service if they were invited. 82% of people interviewed that were unchurched people said they would actually go and experience a church service if invited. But the reality is only 2% of Christians will ever invite someone to church. You know, we used to have the 80-20 rule. No, it's like the 98-2 rule. Only 2% of Christians will ever actually invite somebody to church. 70% of unchurched people have never been invited to church. They've never had an invite. Now again, I'm not saying that you need to throw a barbecue just to get people over your house so that you can evangelize them. I'm saying we can take the pressure off that. Invite your neighbors over your house to have a barbecue just to be a good neighbor. No agenda. Be a good neighbor. Have them over for a barbecue. And then if it comes up, hey, what are you guys doing tomorrow? Are you getting ready for Memorial Day, blah, blah, blah? Well, we go to church every Sunday. Step through the door. And they say, oh, church isn't my thing. All right, cool. Leave it. Drop it. Move on. Give them another hamburger. But I promise you this. Something's going to happen in their life. And they're going to say, hey, neighbor, remember that day at that barbecue you said that you go to church? Well, something's happening in my family. Do you, does your church believe in like prayer and stuff? Like, is there a way that maybe your church could pray for what's happening in my family? Oh, another open door. <laughs> another, absolutely. In fact, if you want to go with me this weekend, you could fill out a prayer card you can meet one of our prayer team. You could actually just bring that request white church if you'd like to. Guess what? Now I'm not weird. It wasn't awkward. There was no rejection because it planted a seed. The Bible says this, one plants a seed, another waters, but it is God who makes it grow. Let's look at these numbers because I like numbers. If you're in a church of 100 people and everyone in the church invited one person, 82% are gonna come, right? Because it said 82% of people would come if invited. So if you're a church of 100, everybody invited one person, 82 new people would come to church the next Sunday. You went from a church of 100 to a church of 182 in one week. But here's the reality. In a church of 100, only two people are gonna invite someone. So your church grew by two people instead of 82 people because we didn't know how to invite. We didn't know how to invite. So we're not trying to play gimmicks. Seriously, I'm not trying to play games. This, this Father's Day thing, this isn't a gimmick. 
This isn't one of those ways, hey man, how can we spend some money to get people to come to church? That's, that's not what this is. This is actually a tool for you. Hey dude, my church is doing something really cool on Father's Day. They're giving away a Traeger grill and a Yeti cooler and some Yeti mugs. Like they're doing, hey, come check it out. Get to play this really cool poker game in the lobby. Take it, leave it. It's an invite. It's to get somebody in the door to hear good news. In a world of bad news, in a world of the economy's gonna fall apart, in a world of all these things, to hear some good news that God loves you, that God cares for you, that he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way because there's still some dark corner of your life that he wants to help you out with. So how do we reach people? We gotta speak the language of those around us. I wanna give you the word reach, real quick, the word reach. How do I reach someone? The R stands for my routines. Routines. What do you do every week? Where do you go? Do you go to the gym? Do you go to a specific coffee shop? Do you have a routine where you are in your community daily or weekly? Do people know you at certain stores? It's funny, I went to a store the other day and the guy said to me, man, it's so great to see you. I've only ever met you with a mask on, right? What, what, what do you do routinely that people would recognize you? Because whatever that routine is, you have a relationship with that person. If you go to a certain coffee shop and before you get up there, they've already got it made because the barista knows your drink. You built a relationship. So what is your routine? E, what are your experiences? What have you been through in your life that you can recognize somebody else is going through? If you ever had open heart surgery, you're gonna have a scar right down your chest. And if you saw somebody else that had that same scar, you immediately have something in common. <gasps> when did you have your surgery? Oh, I had mine 20 years ago. Oh, I had mine five years ago. Immediately, I can, I can see because of what I've experienced, I see it in you. I can use that experience to build a relationship. What have we been through? A, awareness. Are you aware that there are people around you all the time that are in need. They're in need emotionally, they're in need spiritually, they're in need relationally. There's a neighbor on your block who's just crying out, would anybody invite me to their Memorial Day barbecue? Would anybody even care that I live on this street? Are you aware? that the world is bigger than your yard and that heaven is so big that we could pack it full of people if we would share our faith. Are, you, are we aware? See, what are your core beliefs? What are your core beliefs? Do you believe that it is the commission of God to us to go into the world and share our faith? Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I am with you always. He said, go, but he said, I'm staying here. He said, I'll be with you as you go. I'll be with you always, even to the very end. H, be led by the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you. It says this in John 16, 13. However, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you to who is ready to hear the truth of the gospel. And, 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 and maybe he's leading you to someone just to plant a seed. The Holy Spirit will lead you to those who need to be led to him. So here at Family Church, we make it very simple. We say pick four people. Pick four people in your life that you know need to hear the gospel message. Pick four people, four people who are close to you that you know need Jesus, four people that you know need a life change, four people that you want to see in heaven with you one day. 
pick four, pray for those four. Pray for those four every single day. Put a little sticky note on your mirror while you're brushing your teeth. Pray for those four people every day. Pray for an opportunity to either share your faith, pray for an opportunity that they would ask you a question about your faith, or pray for an opportunity to invite them to church. As you pray for them, speak life over them. Speak peace over them. Speak protection over them. The next step is this, then invite them. Pick, pray, invite. Invite them to church or invite them to pray the salvation prayer with you right where you are when, when the door opens. They say, hey man, this faith thing you've been talking about, this Jesus thing, I really want that. Well, you're gonna have to come to church on Sunday. I say, really? All right, how about you pray this prayer with me right now? Dear God, I come to you and lead them right through it right now. Pick, pray, invite. Use normal conversation Use normal activities, use a normal barbecue, use a normal voice, and I'm telling you, it, you'll be surprised at how easy it actually could be to share your faith. If you're in here today, and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you're still on the outside looking in, you've, you've been kind of like that person where it's like, man, I've been here a few times, but I haven't really been sure, but I know today is the day. Today's the day of salvation. I need to make that decision for Jesus Christ today. We wanna pray that prayer with you, and it goes like this if you repeat it with me. If you're watching online, repeat right where you are. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type amen in all capital letters in the chat room? One of our online hosts would love to follow up with you. If you're in the room today and you prayed that for the first time, would you give me the honor of taking two seconds and celebrating you? Would you just wave at me real quick and say, hey, I prayed that today. Yeah, I see you in the back. Anybody else real quick? Looking across. Awesome, awesome, welcome home. We have a booklet at the Welcome Center called Starting Point. It's a six-day devotional that gets you started with your walk with Jesus. We also have another book called Welcome Home. We have a couple high-top tables in the lobby. If you need prayer for any reason today, if you need some guidance, counsel, please stop at one of the high-top tables in the lobby. Father, we thank you today for a mind shift, that our minds would be changed to how you would share the gospel today. You would speak the language of the people. Help us, God, to share the gospel message in a way that's life-giving, that brings people to the truth of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that would honor you in this generation. I thank you that you would give us spiritual boldness and wisdom beyond our years. As we leave here today, Lord, I thank you that we are blessed. We're blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Offering baskets are at the doors on the way out.